to speak um, about this uh, topic. So um, for me, what, what this talk is going to be about is it's, it's you know, the, it's about Coulomb branches and quantum cohomology, but really um, it's sort of like a symplectic, you know, I'm, I'm a symplectic topologist. I don't know much about representation theory. Um, and it's sort of my attempt to try to understand what's going on with Coulomb branches. So usually, um, when I, I think about, I tend to think about subject for many years and, and don't make uh, you know, that much progress, but understand a little bit. So here I actually haven't been thinking about it for that long, so I've made even less progress in my, in my plan, but um, well, I'll tell you about what I've got so far. So, uh, oh no. Uh, something <laughs> terrible. Okay. okay. Okay, so this is part of this is based off of a, a, a paper from this year with Eduardo Gonzalez and um, Chuck Yumak. And then at the end, um, hopefully I'll be able to tell you about work in progress with, with Constantine Telemann, um, who sort of is, you know, uh, proofs, uh, the, the, definitely the, the, the result can be improved, um, but uh, it's sort of, I'll tell you what I've got so far. Um, so, okay, so let me tell you where the, where, you know, what, what the story looks like to me. So, um, there's this, so G will always be a connected compact Lie group, and, and you'll look at it, GC will be its complexification. So, um, so what Telemann, in his ICM paper, what he says is that if you have a complex, a complex symplectic manifold with a Hamiltonian G action, then it should define um, an object in this sort of K, maybe I should put, uh, uh, Rosansky, they call it Rosansky Witten two category. Maybe it's Kapustin Rosansky Witten. I, I don't know who, what the exact name is. I'm really bad with the physics literature, but it's the you know the the 3DB model that Justin was talking about. So it's a two category, um, and uh, and it's of this of a certain um, holomorphic symplectic manifold, which is the uh, centralizer of the Langlands dual group. If you don't know what Langlands duality is, um, you know this is. I say it this way just because, just to, you know, it's the only time as a symplectic topologist I'll be able to say Langlands dual group. I'll give you a, but I'll give you a different way to think about it that's more, um, you know, in, more in terms of traditional topology. Um, so, and then more recently, I, I'm really sorry if I get all the, uh, all the names in physics wrong. Uh, I, I don't know the physics literature at all, but uh, all of these people, many of whom are in the audience, um, and, and, and Constantine independently proposed that more generally, with the same data, you can get actually an object of the B model of any of these sort of Coulomb branches with math, um, which have been constructed by uh, Braverman, uh, Finkelberg, and Nakajima. So, um, so in this today, like I have a choice. Um, well, let me just say that in a second. So, an, what is an object of this two category? So. The problem is this two category and either, either the 3D A model or B model mathematically, um, so far they're, you know, as far as I understand, they're not rigorously constructed, these, these two categories. Um, but, you know, roughly speaking, what the physicists definitely tell you is you have some space. Um, uh, this chalk is melted. Yeah, you should use the drug chalk, chalk here. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so, you know, you have this, this, this holomorphic symplectic manifold and um, definitely part of the object defining a brain in this category should be uh, a holomorphic Lagrangian submanifold. So in our case, it would be something like this. And then it should have a sheaf of categories over it. So it should have sort of um, some version of the equivariant Fukaya category of G, which will lie over this, over this Lagrangian submanifold. Um, even, even the equivariant Fukai category, if you're you know, a symplectic topologist, you don't actually know how to construct a, a good version of this one that has the desired properties. But um, you know, so we're, we're quite far from realizing this picture. But, but um, what we can do, uh, and that's what I'll talk about, is, is describe these Lagrangians. So these Lagrangians are fairly easy to Construct, oh, well, you know, it's 
relatively harmless. And, um, and the cool thing about this picture, which is also in Telemann's papers, is that so you have these Lagrangians. And the interesting thing that happens is that there are other Lagrangians which don't come you know, necessarily from a symplectic manifold. So um, whatever this universal centralizer is, I'll tell you in a second. So you have projections from this universal centralizer to if you, T, the, the Lie algebra of a maximal torus modulo the Weyl group. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, and, and also to T dual modulo, uh, the, these are both complexified. So um, you have projections to the Lie algebra of a maximal torus of the, com of the complexified group, and also to the dual torus modulo the Weyl group. And um, you know, so here you have, you have sort of a Lagrangian, which is like the fiber over zero. Let's say it looks like this. So this will be zero, the thing which maps to zero down here. And you know, so what this map is in, in terms of topology is it's really sort of like a projection. You can think of it as a projection onto the equivariant parameters. So T modulo of the Weyl group is the, the cohomology of, uh, well, it's spec of the cohomology of BG. And if you look at the fiber over zero, what you get is the, or just you're supposed to get back the ordinary Fukai category. So, so the intersection, there's some cat, in other words, there's some category that lives over this. And when you intersect, you're, the, the morphism spaces between the braids is supposed to themselves be a category. And that in this case, that would be the, the ordinary Fukai category. And you also have a more interesting Lagrangian, which is called like the Coston section, which lives kind of over the fiber over one here. It's a section of that other projection. And, sorry about that. And, um, and this one is supposed to be much more interesting because the, inter the category over the intersection is supposed to be the Fukaya category of some GIT quotient. And you know, I'm going to, what GIT quotient is not precise in, in, in the ICM lecture, but I'll make it precise um, in, in the context I want to talk about in, in a moment. Um, but OK, so this is sort of a categorical, two categorical picture that one day might be proved. Um, I can't really do that. But what I'd like to do is sort of decategorify everything. And so I'm going to, you know, over this Lagrangian, we're going to sort of have basically quantum cohomology. I'll show you how quantum cohomology defines for you such a Lagrangian um, and how this intersection here should recover quantum cohomology of the GIT quotient. So what I'm going to do is sort of try to make a one categorical version of this picture. Um, Dan, in your slide, can you remind what B is? Say that again. Can you remind me what B is, the, the letter B? And B, B is the principle of that, uh, a, complex, a representation. Um, so, so for any complex, this, this is supposed to be the Coulomb branch with matter. V, uh, v right? Yeah, but so you started with, let's say, G acting on M, and then B is an arbitrary representation? Is there yeah, a for any representation, you can basically consider the symplectic manifold, which is M cross V, and there will be a version of the story I'm about to tell for that. But I don't want to actually talk about that one because I feel like I have a choice between um, talking about Coulomb branches with matter or getting to this JT quotient stuff, and I feel like this is more... Um, B to zero from that. Yeah, I'm going to set B to zero, exactly. So I'm only going to consider the pure Coulomb branch case. Here. The M was compact? M is compact, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so I'll tell you, let me tell you about these. Um, this might be a more familiar language to talk about the, uh, these um, Coulomb branches or these um, BFM spaces. Um, but, uh, so, Let's just, for simplicity, take a, a, a semi-simple Lie group and um, let T, this, this be its uh, Lie algebra. Then you define, um, you have the set of regular elements whose stabilizer um, is, has like, has the, so, so the stabilizer has at least dimension in the rank of the, of the group. And so we're going to, you know, you, you're going to consider the uh, product of the group and this set of regular elements, which, you, you know, if you, if you, in a semi-simple case, you have, you could choose a, um, a killing form and, 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 and view this as a subset of the cotangent bundle, but, but that's, I'm just sort of making this into a definition. Um, 
And uh, there's, a, there's an action on this space, which is given by conjugation in, on, on, on the group part and the adjoint action on the Lie algebra part. And a moment map for this action is, you know, has just this, if you work it out, um, it has this, this uh, explicit form. And so the universal centralizer will be the, well, maybe, maybe some people would say the universal centralizer is what you get from here, but um, I'll say it's the, it's the quotient, uh, you know, so, you, so it's a holomorphic symplectic reduction. So you take the zero set of this moment map and you quotient by, um, you quotient by a K. Um, and so it turns out that this thing uh, has really nice properties, which I think were discovered by Kostant, if I'm not wrong. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, so it's a, it's a smooth, the, the thing is actually smooth, that's the main thing. It's, it's, a, it's a symplectic reduction, so it, it's, it's symplectic. Um, but it has two sorts of integrable systems that are really quite interesting. So you, on the one hand, you can take this projection, and you can project, you can, you can go back to, oh, sorry, I'm uh, going the wrong way. Um, so you can, you can take this, so it has two different projections coming from its realization as a quotient. So you can either project on into the Lie algebra direction, and you get, um, you know, the, this quotient will be just uh, uh, an affine space. That's like Chevalier's theorem. So, so, so this, so, and, and if, you, if you look at that projection, it's a totally, it's a totally integrable system with um, holomorphic Lagrangian fibers. And you can also project the other way as well. And, um, and that also has Lagrangian fibers. So, um, what to say about it? Um, you know, so these are the two projections that I was talking about over here, and they both have interesting features um, for the story. Uh, and now, because uh, it's holomorphic symplectic, so the, another thing that's kind of important for what I want to tell, um, which came up at the end of Braverman's talk, is that, um, this uh, this variety admits a star quanti you know a star quanti a deformation quantization so there's a so there's a certain non-commutative ring that, um, that realizes this 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 symplectic star where the where the, the deformation is given by this by this symplectic form um, so okay so this is sort of the classical picture. Um, and then the thing that actually allows us to do anything is sort of a more modern perspective, which goes back to um, which goes back which goes back to this result of Braverman, oh no, sorry, Bezrukovnikov, Finkelberg, and, and Mirkovich. Um, and what they prove is that there's an isomorphism. So this quantized algebra is isomorphic to a certain. Um, so it's not quite. Borel homology, it was what they call equivariant Borel Moore homology. In, in topology, you call it Spanier Whitehead dual, um, but, uh, or, or semi infinite homology. Um, but uh, in any case, it, it's, it's sort of a homology where your cycles in, you know, so you, you have a Borel space, and you sort of allow your cycles in the BG direction to become sort of infinite dimensional. Um, but it, 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 it's sort of the natural homology theory where if you have a compact manifold, you know, what I say is spanier white head duality, but you have a compact manifold with, with an orientation preserving G action, um, an oriented compact manifold, um, then that this group is the natural group that you get when you try to formulate Poincare duality in, 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 in the equivariant setting. So I think if, if your matter is zero, then you can just you can see just ordinary homology. So in this case, you just consider ordinary homology. If you're well, that doesn't really have a convolution. I mean, because well, on the ordinary homology, you do have the. I mean, if they have no matter, then it's just ordinary homology. Um. I mean, I don't think. Or, I mean, if you, the module structure on ordinary, like you know, if you even have a point, ordinary homology has a torsion module structure over H star B G, whereas this thing is like free of rank one over H star B. I think this is. I think it's, it's correct. I don't know. I mean, you're, you're the expert. But. We may have different definitions of homology, but... Uh, yeah, maybe. Homology, this is a, 
this is just the way they're going to come along. Okay, yeah, maybe we have a different definition of homology. So this is like cohomology on, on, on the BG direction, and then, and then borel moore homology in the fiber direction? Yeah, like, uh, well, it's not, it doesn't have to be borel moore It's ordinary homology in the fiber direction, but it's cohomology in the base direction. Ah, okay. yeah. so, so this is what I call equivalent homology always, <laughs> just for any space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand that, yeah, the, I, I notice representation theory and topology don't always agree, so, uh, but. So, what is omega G? Omega G is the, is the base loop space. Um, and, um, and so, so this product, it's, you know, I could explain, it, it comes from a convolution, it's a convolution product, um, and, uh, you know, I can, on, on this product is a little bit more, a tiny bit more complicated to define, but, um, but this one here is just the ordinary Pontryagin product. So it's a G equivariant version of the Pontryagin product. You literally just multiply in G, and that gives you a product. So this is actually, you know what you would call the affine variety, it's a very classical object. Um, what's, what's the S1 action on the loop space? Um, it's just, so, so we realize, so you know, if you go back to Siegel, you, you're supposed to realize the base loop space as a, as a quotient. Um, you know, this is the right way to think of the base loop space. Uh, and the S1 action here is just the rotation action. Uh, it becomes, when you identify this quotient with omega g, it becomes some, some formula. But, um, but if you just do, Rotation of loops like this. Correspondence via the, via the unbased loop space. So of course. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. You can, you can, you know, this, this is, this is, obviously set the, you know, this, but um, the, the S one action is more natural to do it as L, LG. Um, okay, and um, and so now this this integrable system that I was talking about before, the one to this one here, this projection, that's just. Um, you know, viewing this, this Borel Moore homology or Spanier Whitehead homology as a module over H star of BG. Um, and, and, you know, so, so okay, so, so for some reason, uh, when we were writing this paper with, with Eduardo and Chukyu, we, we, so we can I ask one more question? So the, 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 G, act, the G action on the, on, the, on the base loop space is by conjugation? Um, yeah, yeah, so, so it's by, by, by conjugation, yeah. yeah, so, or here, but here it would be just like left multiplication. I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're quotienting on the right, it would be like multiplication on the other side. Okay, fine. So all the actions become easier. Easier. Okay, okay. Uh, do I just click this? Yeah, yeah. sure. Okay. That's annoying. Um, I, maybe I could set it to time, but probably not in real time. Um, okay, oh, sorry, I didn't say what I want, one thing I wanted to say, which is, there's also a version of this which um, which also appears in, in I don't know if it's been discussed in this conference, but it's it's, it's there's a variant of this homology, which is where you only mod out by t, um, and that also carries a convolution structure. It's it's um, it's called like the affine nil Hecke algebra. Uh, it's also been studied by Costant and Kumar. Um, so it's sort of like in in. In the, um, in the representation theory literature, they call this an Irohori version of, of this construction. But, um, but this is actually the algebra. They're Morita equivalent. Like this one is just a matrix algebra over this one. So if you want to construct a module, you can, you're sort of free to do um, whatever, work with either one. And, and for us, I mean, I don't really know why we chose this one, but it's basically because the classifying space, because we're working in topology, the classifying space of BT it has like a very canonical version, whereas for BG, it's you have to kind of choose a representation. It's a bit messier. So we, we actually work with with this, um, and um, so now let's go to quantum homology. So quantum homology, uh, just to recall, so we're going to restrict to the monotone case. So we're only going to look at monotone subjective manifolds, which means that omega and the first Chern class of M. Um, you know, differ by a positive multiple. Actually, for this talk, you could, you could always rescale omega so that it's actually just C1. That, that won't really make a difference. And, you, you know, we're going to assume that it's equipped with some Hamiltonian. Um, so, you know, a priori a Hamiltonian T action, later on we'll, we'll assume that it's a Hamiltonian G action. So, um, we have quite, the, the Morita equivalence, I mean, you have an algebra object. You have an algebra over the, uh, in the first thing, but when you do, yeah, I mean, there's, there's actually, oh, yeah, I see. there's actually embedding. I mean, there's an, uh, there's an embedding of, of 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 this into this one. So, um, 
Actually, it's interesting in characteristic P. I mean, in character, this is in characteristic zero that you have that. So in characteristic P, you might have some, uh, there's a difference between the theories, I guess. Um, but so, you know, if you have this uh, structure here, um, then you can form the quantum homology. I mean, you don't even need it to be Hamiltonian. You can just form the quantum homology. Um, and as a vector space, it's just the ordinary equivariant homology. And um, so we're going to do a slightly more complicated version because we're, we're interested in, in quantizations and, and kind of D modules. So um, we're going to look at the loop rotation equivariant quantum cohomology, which has um, an additional parameter u. And um, u is sort of a, a generator of BS1. We're thinking, in this case, we're really thinking of S1 as acting trivially on this manifold. So a priori, it doesn't seem like it, it contributes much, but, um, but it actually, you know, it play, it's, it, it's actually quite important. So, um, so what sort of structure does this carry? So if you quotient by u, so if you forget about u, uh, that has, that's the ordinary equivariant quantum cohomology. Um, and it has a something called an equivariant quantum product. If you include this, this extra u variable, the, the algebraic structure is a bit different, as I said, sort of more in the framework of D modules. So what it has is, a, it, canonically, it, it has a connection, which is um, given by, um, so the connection uses the quantum product. So it's nabla q del q equals to u Q del Q plus C1 um, quantum product. Well, this is, yeah, so equivariant um, quantum product with, with, uh, with, the, with the class of alpha. So where alpha is whatever you're applying the quantum the connection to. And so th this, is, this is more of the structure that I want to pay attention to here. Okay, so here's what we proved. Um, now I can state the result. So you have a module, um, you have a module struct, this equivariant quantum cohomology. So if, so in the setting where M, where the T action actually lifts to a Hamiltonian G action, um, or extends rather, you have an action of this, of this affine Neil Hecke algebra on the quantum cohomology, a module action. And from here, because there's an embedding of, of this one, if you think about it a little bit, you get another module structure over this, um, of, of this, of this G equivariant quantum cohomology over, over this um, Coulomb, uh, pure Coulomb branch. So, um, so a corollary of this construction, and this is the reason why you really want to pay attention to the quantization picture, is that the support <laughs> of this module. So if you take this module and you set Q equals to one, which you can alternatively think of as just kind of, so Q actually is a variable of, of degree two. Um, you know, maybe I won't say that. So just think of setting Q equals to one. Um, then this module will become actually coherent over, over the, um, the actual U, U equals zero limit will be coherent over the, um, the, the I call this so universal centralizer, and and its support will be will be Lagrangian, and, and, and the reason its support will be Lagrangian is because um, you know it, it's basically any time you have a quantization, Gaber proved that uh, your your support of your of your original module, anytime your module um, also deforms the quantization, support was coisotropic with respect to the Poisson structure, and. Um, and so, uh, you know, in this case, the Poisson structure is symplectic, so it's actually, it's actually going to be, I mean, plus, you know, there, there's some additional um, argument that says that it's actually Lagrangian as opposed to coisotropic, but, but that, that's the basic idea. So, um, so this is actually the construction of, of, of this Lagrangian. Um, so that, this is, so let me explain um, how that construction goes. <coughs> What time did I start exactly? At um, 25. Okay, so that's good. Okay, cool. Um, so let me first actually give you some examples of this story before we 
go any further um, when we talk about the, how the construction's done. Um, so if you start with a monotone, just a, a toric variety, um, or Fano, I guess you, you would say in algebraic geometry, um, acted on by, by some torus, then you know, there's some, in mirror symmetry, there's this sort of so-called hori Bafa superpotential, which is, which is a really silly thing. Um, you know, so you have, like, let's say you have P2. Um, it's fan, it's toric fan is given by something like, um, like this, if I remember right. Um, so, you know, these vector points in the direction 0, 1, 1, 0, and minus 1, minus 1. And, um, and what you do is each of, these, each of these rays in your fan gives you a monomial. So it's going to be, in this case, it would be sort of, you know, um, let's say Z1, your hori Bafa superpotential would be like Z1 for this monomial, this vector corresponding to this vector, this mon you know, monomial plus Z2 plus um, 1 over Z1, Z2. Uh, where this is, so, so in general, um, you have your fan, the rays of the fan determine certain weights, and your, your, your Hori Bafa superpotential is the sum of those, those monomials given by those weights. Um, and, and the Lagrangian that you get for, in this case, will just be the graph of that, super, the derivative of that superpotential inside of the cotangent bundle of the, of the dual torus. So in, in the case where we have a torus, this um, pure Coulomb branch, or the, you know, at least the, the commutative part of it, is, is just a cotangent bundle of a torus, and, 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 and what you get is the graph of this hori Bafa superpotential, the graph of the differential. So that's your Lagrangian in that case. And this one is, is so the next example that you might ask is about, a fla about flag varieties, I guess, over, that would be the first non-Abelian case you'd want to look at. Um, and this is conjectural because I haven't, I'm just lazy, um, basically. Uh, so, I have, you know, I'm too old to do like really interesting examples. So, um, so you have this acted on, you know, you take the flag, full flag variety acted on by some G. And um, so there's some embedding of the classical TOTA system into this universal centralizer, um, which, uh, you know, so it's it's a little bit it, it's it's a little bit complicated to describe it. I think if I tried to do that, I'd, I'd waste a few minutes. But it's it's very nicely explained actually in the at the in the appendix to Braverman Finkelberg um, Nakajima's paper on the Coulomb branches of matter, and also in Constantine's ICM address. Um, and uh, and in this case, so you have this you have this embedding. And and what's interesting about this is that um, you know. Uh, if you, this embedding is a bit complicated, but once you have that, the Lagrangian is supposed to just be a cotangent fiber in this, in this TOTA system. So, um, in fact, like this description of the quantum, co of the... Is that, is that an open embedding you're saying? Yeah, it's an open embedding, yes, yes. And so the G equivariant um, quantum cohomology of this was actually described exactly in this way by Given, Tal, and Kim in terms of this TOTA system. And you know, you might say this is if you look at G equivariant uh, hom hom cohomology of this, it's 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 dumb. It's just the cohomology of BT. But um, but what's interesting is is the BG H star BG module structure, which is exactly what you get by projecting this to um, you know the the, the the total projection that I was talking about earlier. And so they act exactly described it as, and so you know this integrable system restricts to an integrable system here and. And they exactly described as the fiber of this integrable system. So that's um, so all that remains is to really like prove that the geometric construction I'm about to explain recovers what they did. But um, you know, I don't know. I'm just uh, yeah. Uh, so um, so the starting point for the construction itself is actually goes back to Zeidel. Um, this is a very classic paper of, of Zeidel. Um, and um, what he does is, for simplicity, let's say you have a co-character. Um, in Zeidel's paper, actually, it's, it's about some like, topology, so he contributes, he considers an arbitrary um, base loop in the, in, in, in the space of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. But um, for us, we're just going to you know, 
to be friendly, we'll just consider a co-character. Um, and uh, and you, you, you can make a bundle over CP1 in the, using this data. So you take two copies of, of a disk, cross M, and you, and you glue them via this, you know, in general, loop of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms, but, but in this case, just, um, you know, the, the co-character, basically, the co-character acting on your, on your, on your space. Um, oh, the, so, um, I, I wrote the product differently than opposite order, sorry about that. Um, so, the, the divisors, so if you take this construction, you, have, you get a, a bundle over, over CP1, and the divisors at zero and infinity are, um, are canonically, you know, diffeomorphic to M. And, um, and so given, you know, so you can look at, at spaces of, of sections, you know, homology classes which map, you know, so you have a map to CP1, homology classes which map to the fundamental class of CP1. And for any such section class, you can consider the, the moduli of two-pointed sections in this, um, in this, uh, in this Zytle space. And, and then, you know, so using this moduli space, you, you, have, you have different, you have evaluations to, so you assume that one mark point goes through zero and the other mark, that's a section, so one mark point goes through zero and the other mark point goes through infinity. And, um, and this gives you a push-pull operation. So you can, you can, um, you can basically, you know, if you have a, some cycle, say, in one fiber, you can look at this moduli, the fiber product of, of that cycle with this, with this moduli space, and then um, evaluate that to the other space. Mm -hmm. um, and so that gives you some, some kind of operator. Uh, to, to make it graded, you always, you always multiply by this um, factor Q um, to make sure that this is grading preserving. And it gives rise to some, some operator on your quantum homology. Um, so what are its sort of properties? So its properties are, um, you know, so, so if you take, if you have two co-characters, you can, you, can, you can add them. And the Zytle operator actually, um, you know, that, that will just be the, 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 the compos give you the co corresponding the composition of, of Zytle operators. So, um, and um, additionally, if you, so if you consider where just one goes um, under this, uh, this homomorphism, um, then, then that, that, that actually gives you sort of a ring homomorphism from this, this group ring of, of, um, of co-characters to the, to the quantum homology. So that's a, you can think of this as giving you some sort of structure over some kind of Laurent series ring here. Um, and, and so, so the question is like what, you know, it, it, this construction existed for a super long time and then um, some like 20 years later or so, uh, Akunkov and Malik, or maybe Akunkov, Pandre, Pande, and then Akunkov and Malik, maybe also um, Braverman, Braverman, <laughs> no, no? Um, okay, use the same idea to define um, shift operators. Uh, and so the shift operator, what it does is um, you know, it's the same idea. You, it's exactly the same moduli space, but you do everything S1 times T equivariantly. And it actually gives you a slightly different algebraic structure. So, um, so instead of being, um, so I'll say what this means. It's you, get, you get a sigma twisted homomorphism instead of just getting, you know, this, is not, this map will no longer be linear over H star, the cohomology of B S1 times T. Um, and, um, and also, the structure here, remember the, the new algebraic structure when you look at the loop equivariant quantum homology is, is this D module, this connection, and then these operators commute with the quantum connection. So that's, that's the algebraic structure. Um, okay. Um, so, so let, me, let me sort of explain what this, this, this twisted homomorphism means. So, um, so if you, if you write down, if you look at the Zytle space and you write down the, you try to you know, extend the uh, S1 times T, you have to say you have a, 
an S1 times T action on, 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 on you have, an, you really have an, uh, a T action on M and an S1 action, just sort of this loop rotation, and you try to ask yourself, what are the actions on the different, you know, the induced actions on the different fibers at zero infinity, it's not actually symmetric. I mean, you know, depending, there's, two, there's obviously a choice of how you put the action on between zero and infinity, but it will never be symmetric. Um, and so what actually happens is that on, say, infinity in one convention, um, the, the action that you get so of S1 times T will be, will be sort of a twisted action. So you, you have an automorphism of this T hat, which is S1 times T, given by this sort of you know, twisting by the, um, by the, by the co-character. And, 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 and that's actually what you get on, on one side. So, so what the correlator, what this count of this two-point function actually gives you is a map like this. Okay, so that's what it actually, it, it gives you this from the twisted, the ec twisted equivariant structure on M to the, to the standard one, which is just like the S1 acts in a stupid way. Um, and, um, and, and so what you need to do is to get the shift operator, you need to first identify this cohomology with the, with the standard one, with the one that, with the S1, with the natural S1 times T structure. And that's given by, by you know, basically taking this automorphism and apply, you know, looking at the induced automorphism on H star, uh, on BT. And, and, and so, you, so you first do that to sort of rectify the situation to get yourself back to the quantum cohomology of the, of the standard action. And then, you, and then you apply this correlator, this two-point function. And that's the shift operator. So, so what this asymmetry leads to in terms of um, algebra, and this is sort of where you can see these non-commutative algebras popping up, is what you get is um, a module structure over a non-commutative ring, which is one where the shift operator and the, so H, so U is my sort of loop rotation variable, H will be my, you know, if T is S1, H will be my other equivariant parameter, and you get a commutation relation um, of this form. So this is, you know, if you look at this, you can, you can sort of view this ring as a subalgebra of the ring of differential operators. Um, so it's kind of like a differential, in general these Coulomb branches to me sort of look like rings of differential operators. Um, so, um, okay, so how are we going to do this um, for more general G? Um, so the idea is quite simple and it, uh, it's just to do this sort of universally um, over the loop group. So, and, th and this is, you know, again, in, in, in inside of this well, um, there was a follow-up to Seidel's paper where somebody sort of uh, considered, considered a similar thing um, without equivariant structure, Sibelia. Um, and, but so we sort of make this equivariant. Um, so uh, the idea is, okay, let's do this. For every point in our loop group now, we have one of these Seidel spaces. So, um, and, and, and they have this, so, so you, can, you can form a sort of universal Zytel. So this is, this is, these are smooth loops. Um, and you can form a universal Zytel space, which is just given by the same identification in every, in every fiber over, over LG. And this universal space carries some... It's still associated to a choice of co-character? No, 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 no co-character. I'm saying now... Now we're going back. This is why I said in Zeidel's construction, um, you know, more generally you're allowed a, lo a loop of, of Hamiltonian oh, right. diffeomorphism. So here what we have is a special kind of loop. It's a it's something in the form L, you know, in LG, which sits inside L ham. So you could make this universal construction over L ham. Um, it's just you wouldn't you wouldn't quite be able to. I don't think you could quite get an action of the, it's for technical reasons, you, couldn't, you, couldn't, you can't really get the full L ham. Uh, anyway, um, you, can get, you, can get, you can get this. Um, and so it has this, an S1 times T times T action on, on the charts, on these two, you know, each of these two charts, you, you, you can you have this on, on each of the things you're gluing together and it, it respects the gluing, so you get an S1 times T times T action on 
on the uh, universal idle space. And, um, and, then, and so what we're going to do is, is take, say, one of these T actions and quotient it. So we're going we're gonna, we're gonna to take, um, take the universal societal space and quotient by, say, one of these. You can choose either T. It doesn't particularly matter. Um, and, um, you'll get, and now you'll have a vibration over this smooth flag variety. Um, and so the idea is just... Uh, you know, so what's the structure here? You have a similar sort of pattern where there's an, an asymmetry of the remaining S1 times T actions. So if you look at the remaining S1 times T actions on, you sort of have a universal fiber over, over zero, which will be corresponding to the subspace of, you know, in, your, in your first copy of the disk. And you also have a universal fiber at, um, at infinity corresponding to your other copy. I wrote that, you know, it's a disk, so this is the point zero, but it really becomes infinity when you, when you, when you glue them together. Um, but in any event, um, the two copies are different as S1 times T spaces. So, um, so on the one hand, one is really a fiber product of, um, of of, of LG and, and M, and the other one is just a, a trivial product, so uh, as an S1 times T space. So, so what we're going to do is basically, you know, we're going to look at, you know, in flare homology, this is a very standard thing, you're going to look at a parameterized count, so you're going to consider a cycle that now maps into the space, and, you know, some fine dimensional cycle, and you're going to use this to define um, to define a, uh, um, you know, the, the same correlator, basically. So what you get is, a, is a, the correlator a priori gives you a map from this Borel-Moore homology here to the Borel-Moore homology of, of the trivial product. This is the fiber at zero, and this is the fiber at, um, at infinity. And then you can project to get something like this. And so um, the little point, um, you, even though this, this space is not really a product, there's still, you still can write down, there's still like a Kunith map from, from the, even though it's a fiber product, you still have a Kunith map from, a natural Kunith map from the tensor product of the, of the affine nil Hecke algebra and the, the, the S1 times T equivariant. Um, for Elmore homology, which as I explained earlier, is, is Poincaré dual to the cohomology. Um, and so you have a natural tensor product like this, and your and your 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 this role, this map actually is playing the role of this um, this automorphism that I used before. So you, the correlator naturally gives you a map like this, and the um, the Kunith map allows you to actually map the trivial thing into the slightly twisted thing, and the and the shift operator will just be the the composition of those two. So the correlator composed of the Kunit. Um, and um, so once this sort of shift operator has been constructed, like actually once you have an action, many of its formal properties are automatic uh, from the T case. You can do kind of an abelian, uh, well, it's not an abelian reduction. It's, it's just fairly simple th elementary thing. So, um, you, you know, so if you look at what, what's actually, it's, it's kind of a localization argument. So if you look at um, this, the algebraic version of the affine flag variety, which is homotopy equivalent to the, to the uh, smooth one, um, then uh, you, have a, you, have a, you have a, you know, you have an S1 times T action on this, on this polynomial, on this algebraic affine flag variety, and its fixed points are actually given by things which are really simple. So it's a, it's, it's a co-character, again, times some, you know, vial element, which is like where it is. So, so co-characters correspond to loops, you know, at base of the identity, but you can multiply that by some, some vial element to put you base somewhere else in this. To base, you know, it'll be a loop based somewhere at, at, at that, um, uh, vial uh, at the base of that vial element, basically, um, and uh, 
And so, um, and so the local, you know, by just the standard localization, basically, this, um, if you, R is the, R is the cohomology of um, BS1 times, uh, BS1 times T, uh, the cohomology of, of, of BT hat. And if you look at its fraction field, then, then and, and tensor, then you get sort of, as a, additively, you just get that it's generated by these, by these elements here. So, and similarly by the classic um, Atiyabat localization, or maybe Kurwa, I don't know, some, someone in Oxford. Um, the, uh, you know, th this is also a free R module. This one here is also a free R module, and you have, you have an injection like, like this as well. Um, so, so basically the idea is, in order to prove any relation you want in, about these operators, because this, 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 is sort of a, this maps is like a, a sub-module into here, you can actually prove it in this, in this localized version. So, um, so that trick, oh god, twist it. Uh, so that trick actually works out. Is how we prove the, um, the both the fact that it's a module action and and um, you know because basically these the, these these co character these vial elements are fairly harmless and these co characters it's just it's just their mod the fact that they give a module relation is just Zeidel's or you know the Zeidel's argument or or the shift operator argument um, and. Um, and so, and then we also, using the same idea, you prove the commutation with the, with the connection. So, um, so because Kukunkov uh, and, 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 and Pandre Pandey and, and everybody has proven this, this, the commutation with the connection, we, this property here also follows from the abelian case um, once the operators have been, have been constructed. So this is sort of, what this does is sort of give you, you know, our construction gives you kind of a lattice in this, well, yeah, I don't know. Um, anyways, uh, that, that's sort of the, the, basic, uh, the basic structure. What I'd like to, I could sort of delve more into that, but what I think would be more interesting would be to talk about um, the next part, which is... I just ask, like, is, do you need virtual fundamental classes here to construct? Oh, to, to do this? No. No, we do not use, we don't make use of virtual fundamental classes to do this. But we don't actually do the, um, I mean, it's it just a... Uh, into the abelian case, and then for the abelian, I mean, for the abelian case, you do need virtual fundamental classes, right? So. Oh, oh, there's a new paper. Oh, oh, that's your question. I see. Uh, there's a new paper by Todd Liebenschutz Jones that does it using um, that has like a homotopy ar instead of using the localization argument that that Malik and Pandre Pandey did. Um, uh, he does it using a homotopy. He proves the module structure in the abelian case using which 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 one do you use to construct the S alphas? What it? We use the Todd Liebenschutz. So our so there's all, our version of the abelian shift operators is Todd Liebenschutz Jones. So we do not use virtual fundamental classes. And it works for which varieties? Monotone. Monotone. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's one reason we restrict to monotone, but, um, but the real reason, I'd say, is, is what I'm about to explain. Um, that, that, that this picture actually works better in the monotone case. Um, you, would, you would need... Um, versions of the Coulomb branch involving Novikov variables that um, don't really exist. Um, so, okay. Um, so, okay, so let's say that, so we're gonna say that um, a moment map will be, so you're gonna, again, consider this monotone situation, um, and we're gonna say that a moment map will be balanced if, um, if the equivariant first turn class is, uh, is the same as the um, equivariant extension of the symplectic form determined by the moment map. So Tia Bach gives you this equivariant extension, and and um, you know that, that we want them to be equal. And if you're if you're an algebraic geometer, you would say that this is the anti-canonical. You're using the anti-canonical. You have a Fano manifold. You say you're using the anti-canonical linearization 
of the, um, to make the GIT quotient. And I want to assume that the GIT quotient is smooth, so I'm going to say that it acts freely. You could, you could probably get away with orbifolds for some of the story, um, although um, I don't do that. Um, so, uh, so let's say that, um, that you have this, so we're going to look, this, so this GIT quotient is the one that's supposed to plug into this formula here. So what we want to do is we want to do a version of the story that only involves quantum cohomology. So we would like a formula for the quantum cohomology of the JT quotient in terms of the quantum cohomology of the, of the Fano manifold. And, and here's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be something very simple. So you have this constant section. Um, and, um, and all you're supposed to do is you're supposed to intersect. So, so this, this Lagrange, the quantum cohomology lives over this Lagrangian. You have another Lagrangian here, which is this coastal section. You just take their intersections. And that, the claim is you know, so that will give you some ring. And, and, and you, know, you might think I should do this in derived geometry rather than in, you know, I should do this as a chain level or something. Um, that gives you more information, but you can, you can just, this intersection, because um, you know, the outcome is supposed to be finite dimensional, this intersection is actually, um, you, know, you, can, you can compute it, the derived intersection and the classical intersection agree. So, so you, uh, you don't need to do it at the chain level, that's, that's the claim. And, um, and uh, you, so, so the, this would be an isomorphism as rings, um, you know, the goal would be that this is a ring and, and this is a ring and, um, and those should be isomorphic. Um, but, uh, you know, you could also ask for a D-module version, which is, which is maybe, you know, using the full Coulomb branch, but I, I, I'm, I don't know, I don't know exactly how to formulate that one, so. Talman didn't tell me, so I don't know. Um, but uh, so this is a conjecture. This is a decategorified version of the conjecture in Talman's paper. Um, so you know, concretely, what would this say in the torus case? This would just say, you know, this coson section. In the, in the torus case, this this is just a cotangent bundle. This 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 um, Coulomb branch, the, the algebraic geometric Coulomb branch, this the classical part, and. Um, and this coson section is just the fiber over one. And so it would just be saying you should just set all the Zeidel operators equal to one, and that will be the, the quantum homology of the JIT quotient. But is, but is ZI, you mean the, the, the Zeidel operator evaluated on the identity? Right, yeah. yes, yes, the Zeidel operator at the identity, exactly. Um, can you say one more time, why are you setting Q equals one? ZI equals one? Q equals one. Q equals one, um, you, you can, well, because that's the thing I'm thinking of as a chief, as, you know, I'm saying, you know, the Q variable, all it does is periodicitize the thing. So it's really irrelevant. I mean, you could say, like, consider it with, with Q parameters as well. I'm just saying, the coherent, in terms of the picture, the coherent sheet is, the, is just forget about Q, which only makes sense in the, um, in the uh, monotone, in the Fano case. Um, and so this is what you actually expect here. Because Q, Q is which variable? Q is the... Is, is, it, is it the sort of Novikov ring variable, or is it the Q is the Q is the Novikov ring variable? Yeah, um, and and so if you have a toric manifold, then you can get a form. I think the only the only actual example that's checked of this, so it's a fairly out there conjecture, um, is in toric geometry, where there's very many different proofs. Uh, Gonzalez and Woodward have a proof. Um, the formula goes back to. Um, I mean, they have a proof that actually looks like, like this in this presentation, um, but you know, you, it, this can be deduced from Batterup's presentation and knowledge of the Seidel operators. Um, so it's, it's a fairly out there thing um, in some sense, but, um, but here's what I've got on it so far. Um, and you know, probably the, the Abelian case, uh, of this is fairly close. I mean, it's, there's still some detail missing, but um, but uh, you know, it's not, not too far. But the G, the G, the non-abelian case is more complicated because um, uh, maybe I can explain. Um, 
So our, um, our idea here, so what we prove is actually an additive version of this claim. So what we prove is that let S1 act on, on M with a balanced moment map, and the equivariant quantum cohomology will become a free module over, over these. So I have a single zidal, oper zidal element, and, um, and its rank should be the, um, should be the, uh, the rank of the GIT quotient. So, so, you know, in a way, so if you think about the story, um, you know, there's, you have the Tia Bond and Kerwan. So the way that, that, that they prove that the um, equivariant homology is free over, over the equivariant variables is a um, is a new sort of the moment map of the moment map of, 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 of this of Morse theory of this of this function mu squared. And so our idea, so so this this result is sort of looking at it, so that's looking, that's what you get by sort of looking at it this way, you would get that it's free if you push it forward here. And here we're saying it's also free if you push it forward here. And the idea is to actually use um, a similar, to use the moment map squared again. Um, but to do it in Hamilton, because quantum, we're going to do it in Hamiltonian polarity theory instead of in Morse theory. So we're going to do it on the loop space. Um, and so here one, you know, say this half mu squared. And in Fleur, but in Fleur homology, if you want to think about what, um, you know, Morse theory, Morse theory corresponds to taking a Hamiltonian and rescaling, rescaling it down to um, a factor close to zero, to some element, very small element. Oh, over. 50 minutes. Okay. I think that's fine. Um, yeah, so I forgot about the, I apologize, I forgot about the 50 versus 50. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so let me just, can I just over time. Can I say one, one, one thing quickly? Um, so, I don't have time to go into this. Um, maybe I can do it for people who are interested, but th there is a question that's a purely vortex question that comes up at the end of the story, which is, um, you know, basically what I can do is I can basically calculate additively the rank of, um, of these, this module over these idle elements. And, 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 but I don't have a map actually, a geometric map to the quantum cohomology of the quotient. Um, you know, and, um, but, but, but Woodward, Woodward does, so there is a quantum Kerwin map of this, of this form. And, and basically what you'd like to know, so I can say that, that it's free over these idle operators, and so if you could also say that the idle operators are in the kernel of this map, which is a pure vortex question, then you would deduce the conjecture um, in the abelian case. So that, that's sort of the question I came here to hear about, to learn what a vortex is, but uh, Anyways, um, thank you for your attention, and uh, um, yeah. Over time, any quick question? I have a question about this uh, construction of the action of this BFM algebra on quantum homologies. I remember that I thought about this some years ago, and I thought that the way you could form it is the following sentence, and it's equivalent to what you're saying not. So you can do things universally over the modulus type of G bundles on P1. You can construct, you can see this kind of Malik Hoffman-Kopf term type operators over bun G of P1, mm -hmm. and, that, and, by, and the homology of bun G of P1 is exactly dual to the homology of the Pankras model. Yeah, I, I think is, so is, 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 is this exactly what you're saying? I mean, or, or is it? Yeah, we have. I mean, we have a smooth version, of, uh, like some sort of version that works for symplectic. Ah, oh, okay. So, so, but suppose in algebraic context, it will be exactly that. Or yeah, I mean, this version. There's also a version in, in Hamiltonian Fleur cohomology, which and it just means where where the an analog of your of Banji of P1 is in your story. So it's omega g. Um, you know, so so I have uh, omega g homotopically. It's it's omega g is a local thing for me, uh, and Banji of P1 is kind of a global thing. So uh, I mean. I mean, they're kind of similar, but... Uh, Homotopically, they're the same. Homotopically, right? they're the same. I'm not sure even what it means to be for them. Is it stacks or what it means for two stacks to be homotopically the same? Um, if you take the space of connections mod the gauge group, right, that's like a... But okay, but... Uh, it must somehow be the same, but, but I mean, that's not... Uh, somehow... We were thinking in terms of like this construction of loops of Hamiltonian Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. So this sort of omega g is what it's a loop of 
some specific kind of Hamilton in different ways. But in other words, you're saying you can construct a G-bundle out of the loop. That's what it is. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Okay. Have you thought of <coughs> generalizing to actions of other Coulomb branches? Yeah, yeah, I can do that actually. It involves another symplectic cohomology story. So, um, it would have, that, like I said, I could have gone in two directions. But, um, I think overall, this is like what I really would like to see is 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 is, uh, is uh, a formula, just a formula for the quantum cohomology of the JT quotient in terms of. Uh, but also, of course, like when you have a vector space, that's, that's I guess, the, one of the most interesting cases. In, in the vector space case, that's exactly what you would, um, you would, uh, that would involve this. If you wanted to do a vector space module, that would involve this Coulomb branch um, construction. So, but, but, but we have a way of, we can also make the Zeidel operator, the, the, these operators, is, um, the shift operators act on, um, on, on, on something called the symplectic cohomology of D, yeah. which, is, which is a localization, a certain localization of the quantum cohomology. So uh, you, could, you could, instead of formulating this kind of reduction statement in terms of quantum cohomology, you would formulate it in terms of the symplectic cohomology. Okay. Okay. Well, let's thank the speaker again.